right. So welcome to um, these uh, virtual neuroanesthesia rounds. Uh, this is Jordan Louis speaking, uh, currently on a neuro rotation at UH. Have been asked today to, to speak about uh, anesthesia for uh, CSF shunting procedures. So this is the outline of my uh, procedure, or sorry, my presentation. Um, basically, I'll uh, talk a little bit about uh, CSF uh, physiology. I'll talk about uh, a little bit about the pathophysiology behind uh, hydrocephalus. And then I'll also uh, touch on uh, the anesthetic management for uh, these shunting procedures as well. And of course, this uh, presentation will be uh, recorded. Uh, you can speak to Dr. Espinosa about getting access to this uh, in terms of uh, using this presentation for uh, future references. So I'll start by talking about um, CSF. So CSF is basically a uh, clear fluid that uh, surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And uh, we've all, you know, obviously seen CSF with uh, a lot of our procedures uh, that involve the neuraxium. But basically, the uh, main physiologic function for uh, CSF is uh, mechanical in nature. So it's basically there to uh, provide a degree of uh, buoyancy to the brain as, and, and to the spinal cord as well. The term that you'll often see when it comes to the function of CSF is um, hydromechanical protection. In addition to its mechanical role though, uh, there's also a uh, possible role of CSF in terms of uh, regulating nutrient and uh, waste exchange uh, within the central nervous system. Although this uh, particular uh, function is less defined uh, compared to the mechanical function. In terms of how it's produced, um, Basically, uh, CSF is produced within the uh, choroid plexus of the brain, uh, within the lateral ventricles, and it's uh, produced at a rate of about 500 mils per day. And uh, it's important to know this number because it does have implications in terms of uh, managing um, uh, external ventricular drains and uh, lumbar drains and such. So. From the choroid plexus, uh, once the CSF is produced, um, it circulates uh, within the ventricular system in the brain, and uh, eventually it gets into the subarachnoid space of the brain, uh, where it's reabsorbed uh, by these uh, arachnoid uh, granules uh, within the subarachnoid space. Um, at any one time, uh, basically there's about 150 mils of CSF uh, within the central nervous system and it's primarily distributed uh, within the uh, subarachnoid space uh, versus uh, about 20% uh, in the ventricles. In terms of how the CSF is circulated uh, within the ventricular system, um, this is important to understand and have a good sense of the anatomy because of course, uh, it does relate very much to uh, the pathophysiology behind uh, many cases of hydrocephalus. Um, so from the lateral ventricles, um, CSF is produced and from there it flows into the uh, third ventricle uh, via the foramen of Monroe. From the third ventricle, uh, it then flows into the fourth ventricle through the uh, cerebral aqueduct. And this is a very important anatomic structure to be aware of because the, um, the cerebral aqueduct is a very uh, narrow structure that's often obstructed and can lead to um, hydrocephalus. From the fourth ventricle, um, the uh, CSF then exits uh, either uh, midline uh, through the uh, foramen of uh, Magendi or laterally through the uh, fer foramen of Lushka into the subarachnoid space. And once the uh, CSF is uh, in the subarachnoid space, it flows uh, through the basal cisterns and then through the um, convexities of the cerebral hemispheres. So what is hydrocephalus? So hydrocephalus is basically, um, it refers to the excess accumulation of CSF um, within the uh, central nervous system. And of course that would have um, implications in terms of um, intracranial uh, compliance and increase in ICP. Um, there are many causes of um, hydrocephalus. Um, some are 
congenital, some are acquired. Um, classically, um, the uh, uh, the classic way of uh, classifying uh, hydrocephalus is based on whether it's communicating versus non-communicating. Um, so communicating hydrocephalus just refers to the fact that um, there's free flowing CSF within the ventricular system in the brain. However, there's uh, usually uh, impaired reabsorption. So some of the uh, potential causes of communicating hydrocephalus would uh, include congenital conditions such as uh, achondroplasia, um, you know, cranial facial syndromes, and uh, the various uh, deformities within the skull base. Um, there are a number of acquired um, communicating uh, causes of uh, hydrocephalus as well. Uh, any sort of intracranial uh, bleed um, and um, commonly a uh, post-infectious. So after uh, meningitis, for example, um, many of the uh, arachnoid granules can actually get fibrosed and scarred down and that can lead to an impairment in uh, CSF reabsorption. Uh, and then uh, that could of course lead to hydrocephalus. So non-communicating hydrocephalus uh, refers to um, uh, any time that CSF flow is blocked within the uh, ventricular system. So there's some sort of obstruction. Um, again, there are congenital causes as well as acquired causes. Uh, in terms of congenital causes, uh, aqueduct stenosis is one that we see uh, relatively uh, frequently. Um, there are other uh, sort of more rare causes like Chiari malformations and um, Dandy Walker malformation, for example. And of course, acquired causes could uh, refer to uh, any tumor growth, um, post-inflammatory lesions within the brain itself, again, potentially related to meningitis, and then uh, infarctions as well. So in terms of how these uh, patients present. Um, typically, um, their symptoms will depending on how acute the hydrocephalus is. So patients who present with non-communicating uh, hydrocephalus typically um, are sicker, uh, have a higher uh, uh, increase in their uh, intracranial pressure, uh, whereas uh, patients with um, communicating hydrocephalus tend to present uh, in a more uh, insidious uh, uh, fashion. Um, so many of the symptoms that, or signs and symptoms that you see with hydrocephalus are related to uh, increased intracranial pressure. Uh, so in the acute um, presentation, often you may see headache, um, changes in their level of consciousness, uh, nausea, vomiting. Um, if there's any sort of cranial nerve uh, compression, you may see uh, uh, changes to the extraocular muscle muscle function, including uh, diplopia uh, and uh, atosis as well. Um, in the more chronic cases, uh, often these patients will present, uh, again, with more insidious uh, onset of their symptoms. And these may be uh, uh, things such as a uh, gait disturbance, um, urinary incontinence, or also uh, changes in their level of uh, cognition as well. The diagnosis of hydrocephalus is relatively simple. Uh, many of these uh, patients will get a uh, CT scan. Um, the classic sign that you'll see uh, in somebody with uh, um, hydrocephalus is ventriculomegaly, as is demonstrated in this picture uh, on the slide here. You see large uh, uh, enlargement in the, uh, in the ventricles here. There may or may not be other signs of increased uh, intracranial pressure as well. So you may see um, to the crowding of the basal cisterns, um, uh, crowding of the sulcal spaces, as well as uh, loss of uh, white and gray matter differentiation. Um, I should mention that in, in patients who have um, chronic hydrocephalus, um, their uh, ventricles may be enlarged uh, regardless of whether they're having a acute obstruction or not. So in these patients, um, the CT scan might not be uh, particularly helpful in uh, diagnosing uh, acute hydrocephalus, or I should say acute on chronic hydrocephalus. So many of these patients do end up getting a lumbar puncture, uh, puncture to actually measure the, uh, the opening pressure uh, uh, to diagnose uh, an increased uh, ICP. So for the management of um, 
hydrocephalus. So um, the simplest sort of uh, procedure that the neurosurgeons can do is, is the external ventricular drain. So often this is a uh, temporizing intervention um, for, uh, for acute hydrocephalus. So basically uh, it's, it's, it's relatively simple. A small catheter is uh, placed into the lateral ventricle. Um, and usually this is done at the bedside with just local anesthetics, maybe a little bit of sedation. However, for definitive management, they will require a, um, a permanent shunt. So basically, it, it's, it's more or less the same as a, uh, a EVD in terms of uh, proximal end of the catheter being put into the lateral ventricle. Um, the main difference is that the uh, distal end of the uh, shunt is uh, actually tunneled into an uh, internal cavity. Uh, this can be either uh, into the peritoneal cavity, into a pleural cavity, cavity or into the into the atria. Um, the most common um, uh, shunt that we'll see is the uh, VP shunt, so the ventricular peritoneal shunt, where the uh, distal end is tunneled into the peritoneal cavity. In terms of the anesthetic management uh, for these uh, shunting procedures, um, it's relatively straightforward, especially compared to uh, many of the more um, sort of sophisticated neurosurgical procedures out there. Um, so these procedures, procedures are typically uh, relatively short, uh, one to two hours in duration. Uh, we don't typically uh, expect uh, too much blood loss from these procedures. Um, patients are usually positioned supine with the head either uh, on a horseshoe versus um, in Mayfield pins. Um, much like all neurosurgical procedures, they, there may be limited access to the airway throughout the procedure. Um, usually pain afterwards is um, minimal. Um, in addition to the proximal shunt uh, in the cranium uh, with a ventricular uh, per, uh, peritoneal shunt, uh, it's, a, it's a small, uh, a very small lap, uh, lap incision that they make. And usually uh, there's enough local anesthetic in there that the pain shouldn't be too bad afterwards. In terms of assessing these patients, um, in addition to your sort of usual history and physical, uh, one of the key questions is whether uh, this is acute or chronic hydrocephalus. Um, and of course, uh, you would do a detailed neurologic assessment, uh, paying attention to any signs and symptom, symptoms uh, suggestive of uh, increased intra intracranial pressure. For the intraoperative management, um, this will really depend on whether uh, the patient has uh, increased intracranial pressure or not. If they do, then your usual uh, intracranial uh, pressure precautions uh, is indicated. Uh, so this would include, you know, sitting the, sitting the patient uh, 30 degrees head up, um, sort of avoiding uh, any significant fluctuations in uh, blood pressure and maintaining cerebral perfusion throughout the procedure. Um, usually these patients are uh, intubated uh, due to the lack of access to the airway throughout the procedure. Um, for most routine cases, um, invasive lines are usually not needed unless there are other uh, patient uh, indications uh, for invasive uh, vascular access. Um, the procedure itself uh, is, like I said earlier, relatively straightforward. Uh, the one thing that we do have to anticipate is that uh, when they're actually tunneling the distal end of the uh, of the of the catheter, uh, it is quite stimulating. So you may have to deepen your uh, anesthetic uh, for that particular part of the uh, surgical procedure. For the post-operative management, uh, many of these patients go to PACU. Um, you'll find that many of these patients may have um, reduced level of consciousness preoperatively that does improve quite significantly after that shunt is in. So many of these patients can go to PACU and then uh, potentially up to neuro observation um, after uh, discharge from PACU. I want to talk a little bit about um, shunt malfunctions because um, certainly in the uh, adult world, uh, I think we're more likely to uh, provide an anesthetic for, uh, for a patient who needs a shunt revision rather than a primary shunt uh, insertion. Um, these shunts can malfunction uh, due to a number of reasons. Um, they can become infected, 
uh, they can become obstructed over time. They can uh, be malpositioned and of course uh, the shunts themselves can actually break or fracture as well. The main uh, diagnostic modality uh, for, uh, uh, for these shunt malfunctions is, is the shunt series. And then the surgical management is either revising the shunt or actually replacing the shunt uh, altogether. Uh, for example, if the shunt is actually infected, they would have to go in, take the shunt out, and then uh, replace the entire um, catheter altogether. So that's pretty much it for um, the uh, anesthetic management of uh, VP shunt insertions. Like I said earlier, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, it's it's uh, um, very, uh, compared to the other neurosurgical procedures, it's really not that uh, sophisticated. Um, I wanna to touch a little bit on um, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, um, uh, just for completeness. And I know that there, there is another uh, video uh, that was done recently on this topic, so I won't go too in depth on this uh, particular topic. But of course, when it comes to managing uh, hydrocephalus, this is one uh, alternative option um, uh, for these patients as well. Uh, basically, the procedure involves um, creating a uh, bypass between the uh, third ventricle and fourth ventricle, and this is done uh, completely endoscopically. Um, basically, they do a frontal burr hole for these patients. Uh, they put in the, uh, the camera, which is also known as a ventricular scope, and then they create an opening between uh, the floor of the, of the uh, third ventricle and the fourth ventricle. Certainly compared to um, a uh, VP shunt insertion, this is a little bit more invasive, uh, but I would say that the uh, overall anesthetic considerations are uh, very similar. The one additional um, uh, surgical consideration for this procedure is that uh, because the ventricular scope is um, operating in an area that's very close to the, to the, uh, to the midbrain, um, there is potential for stimulation of the midbrain or irritation of the midbrain leading to arrhythmias and, and, and bradycardia. So that is something that, that needs to be uh, looked, uh, watched, uh, uh, looked after uh, throughout the uh, intraoperative course for these patients. But aside from that, uh, the management is relatively uh, straightforward and again, similar to uh, that for a VP shunt insertion. So that's all I had for this presentation. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, uh, if you have any uh, questions or uh, any, uh, anything to add to the presentation, uh, please uh, use the uh, online um, discussion uh, platform that's been set up by Dr. Espinosa. Um, I'll be uh, checking on this, uh, uh, on this message board and I'd be happy to uh, respond to any uh, comments or questions that uh, any of you may have. Thank you.